Hello and welcome to this quick video about my process to maiden a new model. I'm specifically going to be talking about fixed wing, but it also covers multi rotors as well. Now I've maidened literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of models here, and you do get into a way of doing things. This just happens to be mine, but I want to share it with the audience, and particularly for a patron of mine who has just tried to maiden a model and had a little bit of a disaster to kind of go through it, uh, because one of the things in this list potentially could have saved him. So if you're about to maiden a model or you've been maidening for a long time, you just want to see how someone else does it, hopefully this is going to help. Now, the maidening of the model actually starts before you even leave home. And these are all here to avoid the common mistakes that I see, which I'll cover in the very last slide. The first thing to do before you leave home is make sure all the batteries are charged. Now, this seems like an obvious one, but I've seen quite a few multi rotors in particular come down into water, two into ponds, actually, because the pilot thought the battery had a lot more charge than it did, because it was only going to be a quick flight, and then it turns into disaster. Make sure the DVR SD card in your goggles has lots of room. If you're going to be flying FPV or you're going to be maidening an FPV craft, I'd always recommend just doing line of sight hovering first, uh, but it's always good to have the DVR running so that you can play back uh, what happened if something goes wrong. On the bench without props, make sure that you can arm the model, make sure that the FPV settings and functions are all okay, that you can see the image clearly, it's on the right band and channel for your goggles if you're going to try FPV, confirm the fail safe action, make sure you can arm it, set the motors running, and then also make sure that when you turn the radio off or it loses connection, everything goes into the right fail safe condition. I'll put links in the description to my videos that show you how to do these things if you're not sure. If it has got a GPS lock, then I would confirm that it does get a lock out in the garden. It might have worked as you were putting it together, but then you might have moved a component that's causing interference. The first GPS lock can take five, six, seven, even eight minutes. So do leave it out there. And it's better to get the GPS lock at home because the second time, the warm start of the GPS, it'll get a lock in a matter of moments. Do turn on the GPS coordinates to be displayed in the on-screen display if you have a GPS in there. For the maiden flight, it's handy. It'll help you try and track down where it ended up. And if it has a beeper on it, I would recommend putting one on, but confirm that beeper works and that you have set up a switch so you can activate it. There are separate devices that you can attach to your model. And if, you're, if you don't have a beeper installed, it's worthwhile maybe just Velcroing something like that on for the initial flight in case it gets away from you. If it's a fixed wing, then I tend to set up dual rates so that I have a switch that I can have less or more sensitive controls. Um, and in my first flight, I'll see which of those is closer to how I actually want to fly it. Some fixed wings will have a very gentle characteristics and you'll struggle to turn it around within the field that you're flying on. Uh, sometimes it just feels too twitchy and you want to go to the, the lower rates to give you a slightly easier flight. The other thing I'd recommend before you go to the field is watch my video on RSSI location of models. You can use the radio in your hands, particularly if it's a FreeSky or OpenTX powered radio from Jumper or Hobby Porter or whoever. You can use the RSSI function to actually find your model if the battery's still connected. You can also use the goggles if it's an FPV system to find the model as well. But to be honest, you'll get much better range on RSSI and you know, you get kind of a quarter potentially up to half a mile um, of RSSI, even if it's on the ground, you'll be able to kind of home in where it is. Last one, which is optional, which I'd recommend if it's a model that you're particularly invested in, and we're all going to have to write in the UK our pilot um, numbers on these things anyway. But I would, even if you are flying a 250 gram model, I'd write your phone number on it somewhere, even if it's on the battery underneath, just so if somebody finds it, they can give you a ring. Once you're at the field, uh, I would always power up the radio and goggles first. Make sure they're all tickety-boo. Again, give your model time to get a GPS lock. And also turn on things like the fan in your goggles. If it's a particularly cold day, you don't want them steaming up if you're going to be using FPV. Um, I've had that happen to me in one of the... Uh, the unintended landings that I did in a field away from where I wanted to be was due to my goggles steaming up because I just forgot that step. Don't be in a hurry to get in the air, let everything warm up. Do confirm control movement, do the high five if it's a fixed wing, make sure your ailerons, elevators and everything is moving in the right direction. It should be, but it always pays to check before every flight. If 
the weather conditions aren't ideal when you get to the field don't risk it it's not worth it for the sake of a day if it's windy or it's misty or sometimes if it's too hot or too cold you as a pilot will struggle to concentrate just go back and do it another day where there's more chance of it being success I always try and pick somewhere with longer grass, soft landing areas and lots of it. So when the craft does come down, that I don't damage it first time out. Uh, the first time with the model, you're learning how it flies and behaves. And the landing can be a little bit rougher than you intend sometimes. Before you start to fly, start the DVR recordings on the goggles, if it's FPV, so that you can watch it back. If it does, there is a problem and it does come down somewhere out of sight, then you can watch the DVR back and hopefully it'll give you an idea where to go and start looking. If it's a multi-rotor, for the first battery, I would just let it hover um, about head height and just run through the first battery, not in FPV, just line of sight, just making sure everything's happy, all the controls are working okay, that when it lands that the motors aren't red hot and everything hasn't let go. And then maybe in the next battery, go and start flying things around. And that's just a way to stress test it and make sure that there aren't any bad solder joints or anything in the power system. If it's a fixed wing, then don't try too much. A lot of problems that I see is because the pilot will throw it and then try and fly it to the edge of line of sight. For a maiden, that's not the point. With a fixed wing, I potentially would try and um, throw it um, without the props running just to make sure the central gravity looks okay. Just test all that stuff. And then for the first flight, just try and keep it four or five meters um, above the ground and just go the length of the field and then let it drop at the other end that way if you do find that the controls are backwards or the throws are wrong or you can't trim it then the model isn't coming down into the ground at high speed when you are flying and you've gone through those initial test flights just to make sure everything's all tickety-boo be aware of the surroundings the sun will dazzle you for example i like to fly at the field when the sun is behind me so as the craft is moving and if it's a fixed wing, banking left and right in front of me, the, the sun is actually illuminating the craft and it's very easy to see exactly what the orientation is. If it's a fixed wing, then you're going to use the trims on the radio to fly straight and level. Uh, that can be a bit tricky for the first couple of flights if you're new to it. But if you've set it up on the bench as per my OpenTX build videos, it'll be close. But you'll definitely need a little bit of aileron trim to counteract the torque from the motor. The body will want to roll in the opposite direction. So you need a couple of clicks in the direction of the aileron stick just to put that into the radio and the elevator is usually a little bit wrong as well it usually wants to sink or rise and you can click the trim in the direction that you need to hold the stick in order to introduce that trim the big thing with this is if something doesn't feel right either with you or the model stop land pack everything away and go back on another day check the model out and make sure that you're happy now if the worst happens and the model gets away from you and ends up landing somewhere out of your sight, then th there's a couple of things to remember. First thing is don't panic. I know that's easy to say because uh, it's horrible to watch a couple of hundred pounds try and disappear out of your life. But the first thing to do is to keep your eyes on the model as long as you possibly can. If it's going down, down behind some trees, make sure you are crystal clear about the kind of attitude it was and where those trees are on the field. So that when you've picked all the stuff around you and tromp off the other side of the field to go and find it, you know which trees that you're looking on the far side of. It's very easy when you look away to look back up and to not be exactly sure where it went down. Don't forget you've got your DVR footage to play back and you also, if you have the GPS coordinates, you can use those and if you have your smartphone with you, you can pop those GPS coordinates into the map app and it will usually show you where it was and it will be somewhere in that area, hopefully. If it's a fixed wing, it could have gone an awful lot further, but that's going to be closer than where you are to where it eventually came down. The big trick here is to remember that you can use both the radio and the goggles to find a downed model. If the model still has the battery connected, it's still transmitting telemetry back to the radio typically, and it's also transmitting FPV. Now, normally the FPV signal will be blocked faster because it's a shorter wavelength. It's using 5.8 gigahertz than the radio signal. So using the RSSI trick on your radio 
is a really great way to be able to find the model. And the RSSI trick has probably found a dozen craft over the last four or five years um, where it's landed and I can't quite see where it is. It's enabled me and my flying buddies to kind of get straight back onto the model and be close enough so that I can hear the beeper. So do watch that video before you go Maiden. Remind yourself of how that works. Have a little bit of a practice with it so you know how it works on your radio. And then when your heart's pumping away because you think you've just lost your model, you can use it to recover it. Again, links in the description. If you can't find it, then use the local social media, your Facebook groups or whatever to let people know that you've lost it. So if somebody finds it, they can bring it back to you. Hopefully, you, if you did write your phone number on it, then somebody will give you a ring. If you didn't, then hopefully somebody will let you know they found it in whatever field it was when they were walking their dog. And the other tip is watch eBay for the particular thing that you lost. Uh, occasionally, people will find that stuff, not know what to do with it, and try and make a quick book out of it. So if I had to put my common mistakes together, this is the list. These are the things that I see people getting wrong the most. So if you try and avoid these, you'll avoid 90% of the problems that I see with maidens. First thing is, I, the big problem I see is not performing a pre-flight check, uh, just throwing it up in the air and finding that ailerons are reversed. So be aware of that. Make sure that your pre-flight checks are done. It sounds like a daft thing because it's always going to be the same, right? But it's amazing how when you're building on the bench, if you're not paying attention, it's easy to get those kind of things wrong or accidentally catch a setting that you didn't mean to. Always use a fully charged battery. Don't try and use a partially charged battery because you're just going to hover for a couple of minutes. It doesn't work like that. Um, you'll end up uh, flying for longer than you think and you're always going to be over something dangerous when the battery starts to give up and the multi-rotor falls into that water. The other big problem I see is not letting craft and models with a flight controller or a stabilizer initialize without moving it. When you first plug a model in, you just need to let it sit and wait for three or four seconds until it's initialized and make sure that all the accelerometers and gyros are all zeroed out. If you move it while it's initializing and then go to fly it, it will fly horrifically. Things like the ZOHD co-pilot and things like the ZOHD uh, stabilizers that they ship inside their models are like this. And I see lots of fixed wing pilots who go for those models and then complain that they fly really poorly. And then when I watch them, plug them in, they plug the battery in, and then the flipping, moving the model about, um, and don't treat it like those people coming from multi-rotors do, where you kind of plug the battery in and you just leave it for a couple of moments to initialize and to beep and to tell you it's ready to carry on. Other big mistake I see is not setting up failsafe. So when there is a problem between the radio and the model, the motors don't stop and it doesn't end up in a failsafe condition, particularly with fixed wing. If you don't set up failsafe and it's on something like hold and the, the model just carries on flying straight level with a throttle of 50%, that potentially could fly for another 15, 20 minutes. It's going to be miles away by the time it eventually lands. The other thing I see quite common is pilots flying behind themselves, uh, particularly when I'm with them and we're kind of flying with the sun behind us so that we're supposed to be flying out in the field in front of us. Um, it goes behind them. They turn around to watch the plane or whatever it is fly behind them to keep it in sight, which is as it should be. But unfortunately, they look straight into the sun and then they're dazzled and can't see it. And then everything starts to get really exciting really quick. Be aware of things like that. I've seen a couple of multi-rotors disappear because they flew towards the sun and the pilot got dazzled and nobody could see it anymore. The last couple of things, one of the biggest things I see is people trying too much on the test flight. I had this with uh, a friend the other day. He was trying out a little quadcopter and um, I just showing him how it all works, gave him the radio and immediately tried to fly it down to the other end of the field. When you are not used to a craft, don't do things like that. Just try and keep it within line of sight and keep it close in until you are happy that everything is working okay and you're happy that you're ready to take the next step. Panicking in the event of a crash and forget about not knowing the RS side trick is a common one. This, I think, is what happened to my Patreon that messaged me the other day. Uh, he would have probably been able to find the model if he had remembered about the RSSI trick and just yomped out in the direction that it disappeared. He'd probably found it because if it's a fixed wing, chances are it'll probably land more or less level unless it was in a really weird attitude when, uh, when you lost sight of it. And there's a good chance the battery's still connected and the radio receiver is still transmitted. 
And the last thing that I see is not taking a flying buddy to the field. It's amazing how useful the second pair of eyes at the field can be just to watch what's going on, uh, to give you a bit of confidence um, and also to help you uh, look for it if it disappears. But then somebody somebody who's there, whose sole job it is to, uh, to kind of watch the model while you're doing everything else can just give you that extra bit of security and help in the event something bad happens. Thank you for watching my video and watching right to the very end. If you want to find out what I'm currently working on, you can follow me on social media by searching for Painless360 in the usual places. If you'd like to become part of the inner circle, then you can become a Patreon. Details are in the description and you get lots of additional benefits. Check out the playlist section on the channel too. I organize all of my videos into playlists and it's called something like Introduction to or for Beginners. All of the content is aimed so that you can start at the very beginning and it teaches you that subject, starting with simple principles and moving up to teach you everything you need to know.